if you're following the study of karate, then you've probably become aware of the, the emphasis on practical karate, or what is being termed as practical karate. And a name that you've probably heard is Motobu Choki. He was known for his emphasis on kumite. So what do you have to say about kumite? This weekend I had an excellent opportunity to train with a number of people, and one of them was Kevin Tobosa. We have a share a connection through the Filipino martial arts, but then we also found that we share a connection of Okinawa Kempo. Well, he gave me a gift and I was very excited. This is a book by uh, Choki Motobu, and it was translated by Kevin Sensei Oyara Sensei. And in this book he talks about Kumite, in fact the book is Okinawa Kempo Karate Jutsu on Kumite, specifically about kumite and that sort of thing. It includes his drills, his, I think it's the 12 drills that he teaches, partner drills for, for kumite fighting, as well as how to build a makiwara and this sort of thing. But there's a section in particular that I wanted to reference. If you have the book, page 21. It says, there are two parts in Ryukyu Kenpo Karate. The one is basic movements and they are taught to beginners. These basic movements are commonly called kata. The other is kumite, and this may be compared to kime in judo. The kumite is an actual fight using many basic styles of katas by grappling the opponent. The word kumi means cross or grapple, and the word te means hand or hands. Thus the word kumite was composed, and that meaning is a fight in accordance with karate techniques and rules. The kumite, or match, has been practiced in the Ryukyu Islands from ancient days. However, there is no one particular style, what you might say standard style. For this martial art does not have a document or literature left to define what Ryukyu Kumite is. What we do have now on Kumite are copies of documents of the Chinese origin and were valued by noble people, warrior class, in the old days on the Ryukyu Islands. So let's look at a couple notes from that. I'm going to go on because there's a little bit more that I want to share, but a couple things that he mentions that I think we don't always remember to pay attention to. This is, you know, the origins, the Chinese origin, and how there is a strong Chinese influence in karate, if not a Chinese root specifically. And this often gets lost. Oh, karate, Okinawan, or worse yet, karate, Japanese. Karate came by way of China through Chinese martial artists interacting with Okinawans, training, and then spread to Japan. And now, of course, Okinawa is part of Japan. But we can't forget that there is connection to China. And when we get lost trying to understand what is happening in karate, a lot of times it's because we forget that, that some of the history needs to be traced to China specifically. He also mentioned in there uh, the kumite is an actual fight using many basic styles of katas grappling the opponent. By grappling the opponent. Many basic styles of kata. Styles of kata. Uh, there's another section where he mentions that, you know, instructors, the, the karate masters would know one kata. And the kata represents the way that they fight, the style of fighting that they do. It encapsulates that. And here it is said in this document, and I'm forgetting the date um, of this document. It's printing, the publishing date was May 5th, 1926, um, edited and printed by Choki Motobu. And this was... Uh, reprinted, it looks like, in November 10th, 1977. Interesting note, says the price of the book was one and a half yen, and in 1926 this price was about 75 cents. At the time, a working man made about seven yen per month. The price of this book was about one-fifth their monthly pay. To buy this book, one-fifth their monthly pay. So people who bought this book knew the value of the information that was in it. Kumite, an actual fight, using many basic styles of kata, in grappling the opponent. You look at modern karate and we realize that we've forgotten the grappling roots and that grappling is a strong thing. Kumite itself, grappling hands, shows that there is a range that we should be fighting in and it's much closer than we think it should be. Why? Because we got good at kicking and we got good at kicking, then we got good at fighting each other and needing to manage kicks and we prioritized dealing in that kicking range, but that's not what karate was meant to do. It was meant, first off, not for dueling, but for, for working uh, against a non-consensual agreement, and that generally meant violence happening at a close range, and the, the significant violence, the significant damage to your opponent happens at that close range. All of the partner drills in here 
are, are within an arm's reach or closer to give you an idea of, of what he means by that. When, when he says grappling hands and, and touching hands, they are wrist to wrist or closer to each other. So he does go on to say, as I mentioned previously, kumite is done by very advanced students in karate, having accomplished all the basic styles and have tried out fighting techniques among each other. However, karate is very rough martial art, which is composed of hardness and softness in its techniques. It is very dangerous to try kumite unless participants are thoroughly trained in every technique of karate. As a student improves in his fighting ability, he can find and choose an appropriate opponent to practice kumite with. This has been the way kumite was taught throughout the centuries in the Ryukyu Islands. Therefore, I can only say kumite teaching was done only through traditional fighting matches until today. Since each person fights differently, there has been no standard form of kumite established. Anyone who wishes to do kumite should be very quick in movement and should choose the most appropriate opponent to practice how to kumihasuzu or block in defense. In other words, to practice how to break off the opponent's attack. That particular theme, breaking off the opponent's attack, is throughout all of his partner drills. But I want to I want to dial into a couple things that he said here. You know, it's a very it's a very rough martial art. It's very dangerous to try kumite unless participants are thoroughly trained in every technique of karate. Earlier, he said there's there's one basic movement taught to beginners, and it's the kata, and then later there's the the kumite. And he's saying kumite is advanced. I want to make sure that it's very clear that this is not misunderstood. He's not saying you only do kata, the solo practice, until you're an advanced practitioner. You don't become an advanced practitioner by doing kata. You become an advanced practitioner by spending time working partner drills, like he references in here, practicing the techniques of the kata, working with each other, and, and building up a, a resistance, a tolerance, an understanding, an ability to fight in, in, with the techniques of karate. So what he's saying when he says you don't do kumite till later, much later, as he's saying, you don't do it freestyle with the intent to harm each other until you have trained well enough to be prepared for that. Kumite, as he saw it, was, was a very, very challenging fight. Some people died. He mentions that. Sometimes people would take devastating blows and die. There's sections in the back of the book where he talks about how to recover wounds and how to, how to help people. I mean, Kumite was serious business. We look at kumite now as, oh, that's just our sparring. And, and it's not an incorrect assessment, this idea of sparring. Uh, but sparring was not, when he talks about it, it was, not, it was not this playful thing that we do on the mat. It was serious. You were trying to defeat your opponent. And so he's not saying only practice solo your kata until you're so good at your kata, now you're ready to fight. Because you will lose. You will fail. You need to be doing the more playful sparring or the or the the partner drills where you're working to defeat certain types of of things when you look at the way his drills break down you see that he's looking at common ways a person might attack you and he's approaching those and handling them and so by doing that handling these common things you might face and becoming very good at doing that then that's what he says is when you're ready to do kumite when, when you are able to break off the opponent's attack, to stop an opponent. And notice that he says, since each person fights differently, there has been no standard form of kumite. So throw out all of your competition sparring and your tournament sparring and your Olympic sparring and all of that. Throw it out because that's not what he's talking about. I don't mean throw it out as in it's no good. I mean that's not what he's talking about. He's saying there is no specific way. So when two men met... Um, and I, I say men, obviously it's different now. At this time, it was not different. You were, if you were doing this, you were a man. That was the way of the culture. When two men met to fight, there was no, there was no specific, oh, we're going to agree to kind of fight this way. It was, you have your way of fighting, I have my way of fighting, and we will fight. And in some ways, you know, when you look at UFC or other things like that, they have their own sets of rules. But in some ways, that's maybe even more true to what was happening in Kumite than our traditional sparring is now because those guys go in 
and they fight the way they fight. They have their, their set of things that they do, the way that they approach things, their preferences, their priorities, all of that built into the way that they fight. And they're not trying to match each other. We're not trying to become good at the same things. You're trying to become good at things that work, things that work for you and things that, that you can succeed with. And then you go against somebody who has their own things that work, that they are good at for themselves, that they want to succeed against you and whoever wins, wins. That is what he referenced with Kumite. So it's very interesting to me. This, is, this has been an enlightening thing to read, this, this concept. And I noticed that it could be easily missed, that people could think what he means is to just practice the kata. And when you've practiced the kata and everything is unfolded in front of you, then you're ready to fight. And anybody who does that is ready to lose and get injured or worse. Because no matter how well you do the kata, no matter how well you process it in your mind, no matter how well you understand the movements or think that you do, there is an aspect of violence that you only get through the resistance of a partner, of an opponent. Sorry, a partner's not even a good word. He mentions choosing a person. Okay, I feel ready to do this. I choose this person and we are going to fight. And with that fight, um, when you chose that person, maybe you're choosing that person because they're particularly challenging or they fight in a certain way that you think that your style could do well against. And when I say your style, I mean your method, not, not your such and such, so and so's karate, just the way that you fight, that is your style, your thing. I always joke on this channel that, that mine is Ken Fu, right? Uh, but that's not far off from this concept that your style is what you do, the way you do it. Um, I think somebody, and I'm going to get the name, I think it was Don, I want to say Don Traeger. I don't, that's wrong. Ian Abernathy referenced him saying that this person mentioned, you know, style is not what you do, it's how you do what you do. And, you know, for me, I joke about Ken Fu, but, but it's true. Ken Fu is how I do what I do. The things that you do are how you do what you do. So your art, your family, your, your, your lineage has a way of doing things. But there's another layer to it, which is how you do the things that your lineage does. You as an individual. Side note for people with karate, uh, Motobu knew that he was good at doing. He was good at fighting. And so when it came time to teach structured material to people, that's when he invited Funakoshi to come and to teach because he knew Funakoshi would do a better job at that because that is not what he did. He didn't do that. He just fought. He understood how to do his karate, and he shared it through doing karate, um, not structuring out into a class. And obviously he wasn't against that. He just said, that's not who I am. This person will do a better job. And so this is very interesting. If you have a chance to read Multibu's book, uh, like I said, this is the Oyara Sensei translation. Uh, because it was written by Multibu, there may be other translations. I, I'm not fully aware. There is more stuff in this book when it comes to, like I said, the two-person drills, Mukiwara, healing, this kind of stuff. Super awesome. Super thankful. Kevin, thank you so much for giving me a copy of this book to read. Uh, this has been an excellent addition to the library. I've really enjoyed its enlightening moments of, of Multibu's thoughts on fighting, on kumite, and what it means to karate.